In lecture 19 of Symmetries, Particles and Fields, we'll be using the ideas that we developed um, in the last lecture about uh, the Lie algebra of SU3 and its representations and applying it to some particles that were found in the early 20th century. Um, in particular, um, these particles are um, come into various classes um, and they fit into representations. I just want to remind you before we start um, about the three representation of S, the Lie algebra of SU3 and the three bar, um, and indeed the um, adjoint, the eight representation. Okay, so chapter seven. Oops. Hadronic physics. So hadronic physics is a study of a class of particles called hadrons. Uh, these come in two classes, of course, the, um, there are bosons and fermions. So bosonic ones with integer times h bar spin are called mesons. And the fermionic ones are called baryons. So the first ones um, to be found were the proton and the neutron, which we're, of course, familiar with from atomic physics, subatomic physics, um, and uh, pions. Okay, so um, there were three pions. There are three pions found pi zero, pi plus, and pi minus. Um, what I'm going to do here is write their electric charge Q, their mass in mega electron volts, and this quantity I. Now, so let's say. Um, Electric charge, this is a Q is electric charge. These are in units where the charge of the electron is minus one. Uh, mass in mega electron volts. Again, remember these are uh, units where we've set C equal to one. So normally you would have some powers of C here um, to deal with the mass. And I um, is a quantum number called um, quantum number and it's called strong isospin. Okay, so what we see is that these three pions have quite a similar mass. Um, 139, 135, just three significant figures and 139. Uh, this quantum number that we label them by is plus one, zero, and minus one. Okay. And for the baryons, um, we just had the proton and the neutron. Uh, proton has electric charge plus one, neutron zero, and again, they're of similar mass. And their strong isospin 
is given to be plus than minus one half. Okay, so um, the interactions of these particles obey an approximate SU2 symmetry. And the Cartan element in our Cartan vial basis, which we called H before, um, turns out to be twice times this strong isospin. So uh, what we see is that the proton and neutron are, are in a um, two-dimensional representation of Se2, and the pions are in a three-dimensional representation. So typically the two-dimensional rep is called a doublet and the three-dimensional one is called a triplet for obvious reasons. So we called this before um, D1 and we called the triplet D2, so it's a really representation space of D2. Um, so this is the doubler, and this is the triplet. So um, we've also called it a two or a three. There's lots of different nomenclature thinking about it. This is also spin up, spin a half rep, and that's spin one. Anyway, so soon um, many more hadrons were discovered. Um, and they seem to have an additional conserved quantum number. Which we're going to call strong hypercharge. Why? So um, I'm going to give you some of them here. Um, there were eight of the lightest mesons. I'm going to plot them in the strong hypercharge and um, strong isospin plane. Uh, and so there's something that was called the charge k on, the neutral k on. There's an anti anti k on um, ch another charge k on, but with the opposite charge. Um, there was the pi plus, the pi zero, and the pi minus, and there was something called the eta. So these are. Um, the eight lightest mesons. And the baryons. We're going to plot in the strong isospin, spin, strong charge plane. Xi minus and Xi plus. Now, you'll notice that these, uh, when plotted uh, on these axes, these look just like um, the eight dimensional representation of the Lie algebra of SU3, the adjoint rep.
So um, we can describe this as sometimes in the last lecture, we were writing this as D with the highest weight state written in terms of fundamental weights. So it's D1 comma 1 of um, Lie algebra of SU3. So um, it, they do, in fact, completely match. If we set um, H1, oops, is uh, the diagonal matrix, a three by three diagonal matrix, one minus one, zero, and H2 is the diagonal matrix of zero, one, minus one. And then I, we set I is equal to half H1, and Y is a third H1 plus H2. Okay, so in fact, uh, they found even more hadrons um, than these ones. Hadronic spectrum is uh, quite complicated, um, but it's simpler than you might first think. You might think at first. So um, after finding some more, one finds that the mesons. Uh, always live in either a singlet, which is D naught comma naught, um, or an eight, which is this D one comma one, and baryons live in an eight dimensional rep. Um, they also, there are also, there's also a decuplet. So the eight dimensional rep is also called an octet. Oops. The 10 is called a decuplet. And this one is D3 comma zero. And there's an anti decuplet, which is D. Zero, three. Some of the hadrons fit into an anti decuplet. So, this is all very intriguing. In fact, it was uh, particularly from Murray Gell-Mann and people like Feynman um, back last century. And the big question is um, why do they live in the representation space of the Lie algebra of SU3? Well, Gelman came up with an answer. And his answer was that the hadrons were all composed of um, smaller or more fundamental subatomic particles called quarks. Now, um, the quarks, he said, live in um, a three D one comma zero, um, and anti quarks live in a three bar D zero comma one. And so the key insight here was that the mesons were combinations of quarks and antiquarks. 
um, whereas baryons are combinations of three quarks or three antiquarks. So of course, um, these quarks um, have spin a half. So when you add them, you um, you add two, and antiquarks also have spin a half, total spin a half. So when you add them, you get either spin zero or spin one. You certainly get a baryon. Um, and so um, th those were the mesons. Um, so whereas combinations of three quarks or three antiquarks make baryons. And of course, if you had three of these spin half objects, you're going to get a fermion. So um, a fermionic field. So let's consider a fermionic particle. Consider a meson. So um, it has a state of, um, well, Q tensor products with Q prime bar. Now, the prime just says that um, this, this type of quark that's then been taking the antiparticle off can be a different type to the Q. And the bar denotes anti quark. Okay, so this is just a quark key. Um, right, so let's say um, we have two conserved quantities on separate Hilbert spaces. So um, these are operators which act on the Hilbert space, on Hilbert space one, and I2 on Hilbert space two. Um, the operator acting on the meson is, well, we have a total um, conserved quantity uh, and it's I1 cross um, 1, 2 plus 1, 1 cross I2. Now, um, this is the identity operator on H2. So I should, well, let's say that. Where one I is the identity operator on the Hilbert space I. So uh, we notice that this looks just like the tensor product. Uh, well, of two representations. Okay, so uh, mesons live in, um, well, a quark, uh, we're saying that there are, it lives in a three representation, so a three cross uh, a three bar 
which is one plus eight. So we get some mesons that are singlets, but we get some in, our, in octets. Uh, whereas baryons, live in a three cross a three cross a three. This is a one plus eight plus eight plus a 10. <clears throat> okay, so um, So let's have a look at a uh, meson octet in more detail. So let's say these three, let's call, call the thing that discriminates these three quarks as flavors. So we're just going to call them with different names. Um, we call them um, U, D, and S after up, down, and strange. So we, if we have some quark, which um, quark field, um, I'm going to put it in a three-dimensional representation. And it's going to be like U D S. Um, and of course, the anti quark now lives in a three bar, which will be U anti up, anti down, and anti strange. So this lives in representation space of D zero comma one. Now, um, right, if the symmetry were exact, if this flavor symmetry were exact, we'd expect all of the members of uh, one multiplet to have exactly the same mass. And even um, you know, in the beginning, we saw that with pions and protons and neutrons, they have almost the same mass, but not exactly. Um, so this is an approximate symmetry, it's not exact. Um, it's also global symmetry. So I'm going to denote this symmetry as SC3F. F is um, flavor for flavor. So this is approximate. Uh, and global, it's a global symmetry as well. So what um, the symmetry is doing is actually saying, as far as this approximation goes, these kind of quarks are um, more or less the same. And so this SC3 symmetry mixes them up. Um, in a certain way, and, and uh, particles in the same multiplets have similar, similar properties. In particular, they should have the same mass, roughly. Now, if we look again at our lightest meson diagram, we can identify now some of the states in it. So we have this octet, remember. We can identify some of the states in terms of the uh, flavors of quark. Now, um, I'm not going to give you 
the flavor. Well, okay, so pi zero is made up of um, a certain combination of UU bar, DD bar, and SS bar. Uh, so it's the eta. So, uh, which we didn't, we don't need to go into here. So um, these three flavors have approximately the same properties. Now, you should note that um, there's a symmetry in quantum field theory, um, which is called CPT, charge times parity times uh, time inversion. And when this uh, symmetry is coupled with um, a Lorentz invariant local quantum field theory, um, it has some implications for um, how the particle is related to that antiparticle. They, they have exactly the same mass um, and uh, their interactions are, are related in a very precise manner and constrained manner. Um, and the, the thing that differs between the particles and the antiparticles is that all of the quantum numbers, um, of the weight, which are really come out to be the weights, these are re reversed, have the opposite sign between the two. So they'll have opposite electric charges and so on. So the symmetry among the uh, anti up, anti down and anti strange kind of comes along as well because they're in the three bar and they have the quantum field theory relation relates them um, to the particles in the three. Okay, so um, with our fermion fields, um, we have. To get, the, to get these mesons, we have um, Q bar A, Q B. So that again, this is three bar cross three. Well, we can write this in our decomposition, which we saw in um, chapter three. We did this in more detail for SO3, but uh, the same or similar techniques work for SU3. So what we do is we subtract out this trace part because uh, that's an invariant subspace. Uh, and of course we add it on again. Um, so in the group theory language, in the representation theory, this one describes the adjoint representation and this one is the singlet. So you can see, um, yeah, you can see that one of these is going to be just uh, UU bar plus DD bar plus SS bar. Uh, and the other one's given by this particular, what's left over in this particular combination. So. Made traceless with decomposition tricks or techniques. So we, yeah, so the trace, of course, this in, in SUN, um, this trace is invariant. So it's an invariant subspace uh, of this larger rep. And so we subtract it out in order to, in, we get rid of all invariant subspaces in order to obtain an irreducible representation. Now, um, it's an exercise. which is set for you that to show that uh, QA, QB, QC, so this is now a baryon, is, uh, well, I'm going to define these things in a second, DABC plus epsilon ACD, BDB plus epsilon BCD, where um, DABC is where we symmetrize over the three indices with the appropriate one over three factorial in front. 
um, S is a singlet, Um, the, uh, so I should say this is the decoupler, this D. Um, and we have B, A, B is one third epsilon C, D, A, Q, B, Q, C, Q, D, uh, which is an eight adjoint representation. And um, B prime, A, B is a, an equivalent adjoint representation. So all of these Roman indices go between one and three. An equivalent eights. So, what we've done here, um, if you can work through this and, uh, and convince yourselves of this, is that we've shown that uh, three cross three cross three is equal to a 10 plus eight plus. Uh, so this is this B is the equivalent eight, but uh, plus another, another inequivalent eight plus a one. So to verify that the decomposition is uh, complete, you, um, you must follow uh, the exercise basically in the book. So now consider the baryon decoupler. So D, A, B, C is this Q, A, Q, B, Q, C. So the counting here is the same as for the um, N index SO3 symmetric tensor. In other words, it's um, a half n plus one half, n plus two. So if you substitute n equals three in here, oh, I'm sorry, so n times five. So if we if we substitute in um, n equals three, we get the baryon decoupler. So let's draw one of the, our diagrams in the strong Iser spin, strong hypercharged space of the baryon decoupler. So on the top we have something called the delta. The the um, superscript gives the electric charge of the state. Here we have the sigma. We have the psi. And finally, there is this omega minus. Now, these were all discovered, um, and the flavor content of these things um, it let's take omega minus is um, strange, 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 and delta plus plus, for instance, is u, u, u. Um, so these ones in particular. Um, 
are curious because our course, we've said a spin and a half fermionic objects. Um, and um, there, these two guys are actually spin three halves. So each of these spins must be in the same direction. So we've got um, identical fermions in the same object. And this seems to violate the Pauli exclusion principle. So. So um, this leads us to propose another quantum number that discriminates these three objects. So um, here uh, now, um, okay, so each of, so remember the strange and the upper different flavors of quark, but the proposal is that each flavor has an additional quantum number, this color, and we're gonna use indices i, j, and k, et cetera, um, one, two, or three to discriminate the diff this different co color quantum numbers. So you might call one red, two blue, and three green, for example. Uh, and uh, baryons or mesons um, are color singlets. So for example, lambda plus plus is epsilon i, j, k, up i, up j, up k. That's the way of projecting out um, the singlet state. And so now um, this color uh, quantum number is different in each of these terms for each, for each of these up quarks, uh, and we don't violate Pauli exclusion. If we look at um, a pi on, for, for instance, pi plus, um, well, pi plus is u uh, d bar, but now um, quarks have color and with a downstairs index and anti-quarks have anti-color with an upstairs in index. So if we just sum using the um, invariant tensor, um, we uh, of SU3, we sum over these, we get singlet as well. Now, I should point out um, this omega minus is a proper particle. Um, you can see it uh, in bubble chambers, for instance, traveling um, a certain distance when you take photographs of it and then decaying. Um, but the other particles aren't, the other states listed here aren't, don't really last for any length of time. Um, they're known as resonances. I mean, they're states in the theory, they don't last for any length of time, but the way that they're picked up is you do some scattering of other particles and they show up as um, peaks in cross sections. That's why they're called a resonance. peaks in a cross, -se cross section is proportional to the scattering probability. So let's actually say that peaks in scattering probability um, as a function of center of mass energy.
And actually, so the position of this peak in the center of mass energy tells you what the mass um, of the resonance is. Okay, now let's look at our um, up quark in terms of this color symmetry. So now we have some different axes, some kind of color axes. The idea is that this color space is completely divorced. It's orthogonal to um, the flavor space. So we take one of these, any one of these flavors, um, and in fact, these up quarks lie in a three, and um, we call these three different color so so these would be um h1 color say h2 color and for example um u bar the anti up quark well we reverse the colors so instead of a red we have an anti red um, instead of a green, we have an anti-green, and instead of the blue, if we reverse both, both the signs of both axes, we get an anti-blue here. And this is a three bar. Now, as far as we know, uh, unlike flavor symmetry, this uh, color symmetry is exact. So the color symmetry is called quantum chromodynamics. QCD for short. Um, and this is um, exact as far as we know. I mean, the way it's formulated uh, theoretically is that it is an exact symmetry and all the tests so far say that it's exact experimental tests. Now, it's not a global symmetry, it's a, a local local symmetry, also known as a gauge symmetry. And we're going to cover um, gauge symmetries, starting with a simpler one than this, in the ne next lecture. Um, so gauge symmetries add a kind of uh, different complication to do with the field theory. Um, we're going to start off with a much simpler one, which is uh, U1 gauge symmetries first, and then we'll um, go up to more general gauge symmetries that will cover ones like um, this one or like um, as you find in the rest of the standard model. That'll be next, next lecture.